Uh, but I think we can just go ahead and get started here. Great. So welcome, Karen, and welcome to all of our attendees. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Brian Gibson, and I'm a music education editor at GIA Publications, and in fact, have worked with Karen uh, on the book that she's going to be discussing tonight, Dance Like a Butterfly. It was, it's a wonderful resource. It was a wonderful experience. I'm very excited for you all to hear more about it. Um, but before we get started, I just have a few logistical items to cover. Uh, one is about the chat, so please feel free to um, have discussion in the chat. Go ahead and if you haven't already put your name, where you're located, and what you teach, just kind of as a way of introduction. Um, we are recording this webinar, so if you're not able, or if you have to leave early, or if you know someone who wasn't able to watch it live, uh, we'll be putting this up on our YouTube and Facebook um, pages here in the next several days, so you can go and re-watch or send it to someone else to watch later on. Um, we are going to save about the last 15 minutes, so uh, it's currently 7 o'clock here central time, so around 7.45, um, we'll kind of, I'll kind of um, interject and we'll, we'll go into some Q&A, and if you do have a good question, um, the place to put that is down at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A chat, which is different from the regular chat um, that's over on the side, and that'll just help me, I'll kind of keep track of the questions, uh, and then I'll field those. Uh, to Karen at the end in the last 15 minutes there. And then I did also want to mention that um, for this webinar, we are offering a, a special promo coupon code uh, for Dance Like a Butterfly. I'll put this information in the chat so everybody has it to reference, but that promo code is going to be butterfly15 for 15% off uh, the book through October 1st. So uh, like I said, once we, once we kind of get going here, I'll, I'll put that over in the chat so everybody has it. And then uh, I just want to quickly introduce Karen with a short little bio. Karen Howard is uh, Associate Professor of Music at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, where she teaches courses in music education, vocal pedagogy, research, and global music traditions. She has extensive training in global vocal, instrumental, and dance traditions from many music cultures, including Ghana, and her research interests and publications include world music cultures, music activism, and global singing traditions. And I also want to mention that Karen is the series editor of our World Music Initiative series. Uh, and that, uh, of course, is meant to celebrate and explore musical traditions from around the world, and uh, especially those that have been historically underrepresented in the music classroom. Uh, so like I mentioned, the first book in this series is Dance Like a Butterfly. That came out, I think we determined just uh, last November, Karen, that's whenever that first came out. So it's been out for several months. It's been doing incredibly well, a very warm reception up to this point. So I think with that, I will just turn things over to you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks so much, Brian. And, and again, just to publicly say to you, thank you so much for being an amazing editor and support. You're, you're a wonderful collaborator and, and you help bring our visions out to teachers in the field. So thank you so much for that. I, I appreciate that. It's, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, he and I usually talk via email, so it's a treat <laughs> to be able to hear your voice. Mm -hmm. And hello to everybody that has been coming in after we got started. It is a pleasure to be talking to you tonight about um, a series and a project so very dear to my heart. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. I've got a few, a few slides prepared to walk us through some things. So as Brian mentioned, uh, the book that we're talking about tonight, Dance Like a Butterfly, Songs from Liberia, Senegal, Nigeria, and Ghana, which I co-authored with my longtime teacher, mentor, and friend, Kwasi Dunyo, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about him in a moment. This was is the first of hopefully many uh, resources for music educators to come out of a series that we're calling World Music Initiative. And as Brian mentioned so importantly, that all music is music of the world. We are trying to focus on some of the traditions that have been uh, left out, underrepresented, marginalized, not within their own cultures, but by the field of music education in the US. And while these materials can be used anywhere in the world, we're certainly looking at it from, as, as I, as the editor, uh, have a US perspective in education. And then we're collaborating with educators from different countries to help uh, different countries, different cultures abroad and within um, to help us shape the richness of the series. And I can't talk about this book 
without going back and thanking. This is a wonderfully uh, throwback, a wonderful throwback picture of my longtime friend, also a mentor and inspiration, Bhavani Judith Cook Tucker, who back in 1985, when she was an ethnomusicology graduate student at Wesleyan in Connecticut, thought, you know what? Let's make a publishing house to create materials to uplift traditions that we don't normally see. And that was World Music Press, uh, which created countless titles. And I was a new teacher shortly after that. And everyone I would grab, and this was before the internet. And that's really how I educated. I would read those books and, and write in them and listen to the tapes. Remember tapes? I would listen to the tapes again and again and again. Uh, for example, Let Your Voice Be Heard, which had to do with her graduate work with her teacher from Ghana uh, at Wesleyan, Abraham at Zinia, and her teacher from Zimbabwe, Dumasani Maraire. So this book, I think, became a template for the kinds of materials that have inspired me and many others, like my mentor, Patricia Sheehan Campbell, who authored and co-authored many books for the series. And the intention is an ethnomusicological approach to music education, where we consider what do ethnomusicologists look at, broadly speaking? They look at music in culture. They look at music as culture. They look at its function. They look at the people, the stories, the geography, the history, the relationships, and how that then emerges through musical traditions. And all of that is included. Another book that greatly influenced me at the time was Roots and Branches. And Roots and Branches was not one particular culture, but it was a model that I strongly responded to because they interviewed musicians from particular cultures. You might say culture bearers, artists, musicians, experts of a culture, whatever phrase you're comfortable with, somebody who deeply knew their tradition could be interviewed and then shared. Also, this was the place 25, 30 years ago, it was the only place that you could find Native American indigenous materials that had been done in collaboration with members of that indigenous culture. That's always been a very complicated one where indigenous musics had a history of being appropriated out into series textbooks without contextualization and certainly without permission, right? So that we didn't understand the process of music making, music giving, music sharing. So the list could go on and on, but really Judith's work was always an inspiration for me. And then she retired, good for her, and she's living a musical artistic creative life and is a grandmother in California. And I called her a few years ago to say, what if I found a way to pick up where things left off when you retired? How would you feel about that? Would you feel comfortable? Do you trust me? Could I frame it as such? And we ended up talking the afternoon away as I happily paced through my house on the phone, just um, imagining what might this look like and, and how might we continue forward? I didn't think that much needed to be modified in the 15 years or so since her retirement, but I did think perhaps um, it needed, it when needed, um, some more contemporary dialogue um, regarding race, anti-bias, um, sociocultural connections, whenever possible to really include what we're trying so hard to help teachers feel comfortable with, to include tips and guidelines and lesson examples for how to include this language in your teaching. That leads us to Dance Like a Butterfly. Um, this, this handsome gentleman here is my teacher, Kwasi Dunyo, in both of these pictures. He is a master drummer, teacher, father, friend. He's been teaching for decades. Um, and the reason I was lucky enough to connect with him is this talented and generous woman, Kathy Armstrong, in the lower picture. Kathy became a student of Kwasi back in 1990, 1991, somewhere in there. She, um, at the time, was living in around Toronto, I believe. She, she's further north in Ottawa now. Um, but she, was a, she is a percussionist and studied with Kwasi in depth and then started bringing him to Canada as an artist in residence. And he's so dynamic and so charming and such a gifted teacher 
particularly to understand how folks from the West who are trained with a with a different reliance on notation and maybe our ears weren't as strong as those from a predominantly oral tradition. He just has the magic touch. Um, so she introduced me to him back in 1996 uh, and we have been collaborating together ever since. So I really think of this book, uh, in addition to being a collaboration as a way for me to honor him and all of his knowledge that I, I don't know why, but I was lucky enough to receive uh, his teaching, and I, I hope to continue to do so for as long as, as I am in education. So Kwasi, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, and all of these materials that you shared with me, you know they're now reaching even more children and families and students and, and music ensembles. I also have to give a shout out to my stepdaughter, Adrian, who did the beautiful artwork for the cover. It's pretty incredible. And she's heading off to uh, college shortly. So it's a, a wonderful project to wrap up her time at home. The intention with this book was to heavily focus on the music of Ghana as that was the main inspiration. But of course, if you go in depth studying the music of Ghana, you're going to bump into the neighboring cultures. And you're, the more you learn about it, the more you're going to find out about differences and commonalities about the countries that move around that curve. So we gathered materials together from these four cultures, and I tried to put a pedagogical eye on this to make sure we had a wide variety of materials for singing, for games, for instruments, for ensembles. And we also, I'll, I'll show you some of the examples, but we also tried to set it up so that you have multiple options with everything that we included. So if it's a simple tune, here's the simple tune. Here's a way to extend it. Here's a way to add movement. Here's a way to add poetry. Here's a way to get into the study of proverbs. Here's a way to connect with art and, and expanding, expanding. Sometimes we just want a little slice of something. And sometimes we want the opportunity to revisit something, maybe in a different year, or maybe later in the year, um, or maybe we just want to keep going. So that, that was the intention of this book, was to give you so many options. OK. Um, just to orient you to where we're talking about, Ghana is in West Africa, as you see here. But the pieces in this book that are from Ghana are from the southeast corner of Ghana. So that's how specific we're trying to get with this series. You know, I'm not from Africa, so I'm not comfortable calling it African. My teacher Kwashi, he's from Ghana and he actually is African. So when he says it, that's one thing. When I say it as a white music teacher in the US, I need to really be careful about my language because then it sounds like I'm sort of erasing the individuality of these different countries and the richness within. Ghana has more than 50 indigenous languages. English is the national language, but then again, within are all of these um, different presentations, different musical practices, uh, different food variations on, on related ingredients, different instruments, different clothing styles based on similar fabrics. So lots of commonalities and then lots of individual expressions. So. The Ewe culture is Kwasi's culture. This is where I've spent most of my time when I visit Ghana. And the material in the book is from this area as well. So for example, let me just walk you through a few minutes of the way we've presented things here. One of the uh, chants that I learned from Kwasi 20 something years ago is a simple butterfly chant. And it's in English. And sometimes somebody actually, I usually get asked, why in English? And somebody just sent me a private message the other day. Why are there things in English? Um, Ghana was colonized by the British. Um, Ghana was the first country to gain their independence from colonizing in 1957. But keep in mind, there was before colonization, right? So there's that whole history. Then there was the time of colonization. Then there's post-colonization. So English is still the national language. And one of my dear friends asked me when this book was coming together, well, if English was from colonization, why would you include these in here? And I said, because these chants belong to the people. These, these chants came to me from children that taught them to me while I was there. So for me, 
I don't think it's my place to say, you, you shouldn't sing that, it came to you via this way, right? Because it's known within the culture why English is the language, but it's also then taken ownership of, right? So it, it's, a, it's a sensitive line that I don't know if I'll ever get it exactly right. I'm not sure, right? I'll just keep trying to make sure that I understand these children are learning English in school. It's the language they need to speak in order to graduate. Um, it's a language they speak when talking to people from other ethnic groups that maybe they don't share a, a, the same indigenous language. So they might switch to English. Uh, it, it makes it easier for them to then transfer out to other English speaking training facilities if they so choose, et cetera, et cetera. There are also something like 800 species of butterflies in Ghana. So I learned several butterfly chants, songs, games, and I even saw one on the sand one day. As, now I don't have big hands, but it was as big as my hand with what looked like two big eyes on it. Those were just part of the design. So I was really struck by that. Um, and, and Kwashi shared this little chant with me back then. It goes like this. Butterfly, butterfly, come back to me. Butterfly, butterfly, come back to me. Fly low, fly high. Butterfly, butterfly, come back to me. Simple, simple. My goodness, you could use this with preschoolers. You could use this in a baby class. You could use this anywhere, anywhere in elementary school. But I've also used it with middle schoolers, high schoolers, adults, because you can play with this, right? And in the book, I give you so many different suggestions for how you might extend this, for how you can transfer it to rhythm sticks, for how you could clap the rhythms, for how you could transfer it to body percussion, et cetera. Lots of different ways you can play with this. Sometimes, now I know I have worked with some people that I saw pop up on this before, and I'm often <laughs> railing against the time we spend on notation reading. Notation reading for me as a professional musician, it's so handy and it's important for me as a professional. For many students that come through school, is it a critical top priority? Not for me anymore, it used to be. I think it's an important skill to have with great benefit, but I don't place it above embodiment of music or joyful music making, right? But sometimes even I, with all my railing against notation, find great use for it. So I've gathered some photos of some Ghanaian butterflies, transferred it, their names into English to use as a rhythm reading exercise, right? So for example, large, yellow. Now you could have them read the butterfly name, or you could read it with your ta and tadi, your do and your due day, your tt, your Mississippi, because whatever you use, your rhythm system is the best. That's what I always say. The rhythm system you use, it's better than everybody else's, and you can feel really good about that you picked the best one. But what I really mean by that is it's the consistency that matters. So being consistent with whatever rhythm syllable system you pick, that's what matters, right? So you could play with that. They could do this on their instruments. What if you're using this in ensemble, they could pick pitches to put this with and sing it as an Im improvisatory exercise. So we've got large yellow. And by the way, all of these slides come with the book as part of the online components. Brian created a great website that has um, a link where you can download all of the PowerPoint slides that we created to go with the book, plus uh, links to recordings, links to pronunciations, links to video for the choreography for a couple of pieces. So that's all included. And then we've got widespread forester, og burgers, yellow glider, blue policeman, common orange sprite, dark banded Judy, Scarlet tip, common silver spot, splendid Temis forester, western Goombia, right? You get the idea? And then I put them up like this. Now you could do it this way. It could be in their music folders. They could have manipulative kits. It could be on their iPads or whatever the way it could be on things you roll. I know some people like to put things on rolly boxes, right? However, you want to throw this out there and then they get to play with these. Or you pick two, play them for me, and I'll try to figure out. It reminds me of Soul Train, but there are probably very few people on this call old enough to remember the jumble on Soul Train, 
but I'm one of them. Um, and then maybe you take your two and you mix with somebody else and you teach the two to each other, right? So many different things. Or remember this, butterfly, butterfly, come back to me. What if one half of your ensemble or your class does butterfly, butterfly, while the other half plays their rhythms? Then switch. What if they switch butterfly, butterfly to some sort of percussion? And these butterfly rhythms here get interpreted in some sort of group movement, right? I mean, my gosh, the possibilities are endless that you could do with this. And sometimes, well, I like to add even more. So instead of a chant, what if I then want to add a song? So this is one of the songs that is included in the book. Um, and when you just see it like this, this often scares some people off when they see something in another language. And one of the main reasons I hear when I'm working with teachers is I just don't even know where to start when I'm coming in with a different language. So in the book, for each song, I've created slides for you that you can change. They're not set. So if they don't, you know, once you download them, if they don't work for you just like they are, my gosh, change away. Um, but I've showed you the way that I introduce it when I'm doing this with whatever age. I'm pretty much the same regardless of the age that I'm working with, except maybe for the number of parts deep that I'll go, right? So if I'm working with lower elementary, early elementary, I might do singing with one or two other parts. If I'm doing upper elementary, I might do singing with four parts, five parts. If, I, if we're adults, then the parts are limitless, right? High school students on up, the parts can be limitless. Um, so for example, what I might do with this song, if you couldn't see it, pretend you can't see this one. Um, I have this process written out in the book for you too. I might say, count how many times you hear me sing, kafo, which means don't cry, kafo. Kafo, kafo ni moko kweodan, fika kekpo yeodan, kafo ni moko kweodan. And maybe they didn't get it the first time. Maybe somebody said four, maybe they said seven. Somebody forgot to count. Somebody else says 12. Well, that gives you a reason to sing the whole song again, rather than line by line feeding it to him, to them. To me, I always say that's like giving me dinner, but one ingredient at a time, right? Here's the cumin. Here's the salt, right? Instead of here's the recipe, let me have a taste. Now let's talk about what this is about, right? So we know four times. Kapo, kapo, kapo ni moko kweodan, fika kekpo yeodan, kapo ni moko kweodan. Then I offer suggestions for questions. If they work for you, great. If they don't, write in your own questions that work for you. But I usually ask, What's the difference about those? Are any of them the same? And then that gets us to, yes, the first three are the same. Kafo, kafo, kafo ni. And what about the last one? Depending on the age or their English proficiency, they might show you with a gesture. The bottom one is lower. Kafo. Uh, I also include in the book a phonetic pronunciation based on US English. But then here's a slide that I put up. So we, we listened, I sang it several times. They identified a part that is the same. And then I asked them to sing those four. So then they sing, kapo, 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 and I sing the next part, and they wait till the next part, kapo, right? Then we add a little bit more. I ask them, listen to me, sing it again, and I give them something else to listen for, active listening, instead of spoon feeding, right? Spoon feeding would be, sing this after me. Fika kekpo yeodan, fika kekpo yeodan. I'm already sleeping. Sometimes you have to do it. I just don't use it as a default. And I go through that way until they're actually able to sing the whole thing, okay? And then I take away all the lines. Oh, by the way, students of any age through adulthood love where they have almost everything and you only have one word or two words, because that's the hardest when you hardly have anything to sing. And we know from research, from quite a bit of research, not just in music education, that students respond to a good challenge a healthy challenge. It gets us into flow state and it allows us to feel the time is just going quickly and we're just gobble, gobble, gobbling up the parts of whatever it is that we're learning. Now, I'm gonna show you a little video. It is very short and it might be jumpy. It's still worth showing it to you. Um, I was doing a residency at an elementary school 
So this will be a young children's interpretation of this piece, but it could absolutely be performed all the way through elementary into middle school. And I would absolutely use these with high school and older as well. They wanted to sing Kafo first. No, sorry. First, they wanted me to do some Blatt de Blatt on drums. Then they wanted to sing Kafo. Then they wanted to do Butterfly, Butterfly. Then they wanted to have Kafo happening while some of the kids did Butterfly, Butterfly on sticks. Then they wanted to sing Kafo again, Butterfly again, and classic universal ending. Bah, they wanted to throw their hands up. Okay, so um, maybe Brian, you, I'll start playing the video and then you could just let me know, is the quality enough to let it keep playing? And if not, I'll just let it go for like 30 seconds or so. Sure. If it's, if it's good enough to watch for about a minute and a half, then just give me the thumbs up. Okay, all right. All right. Oh, this is what the notation looks like. Don't need it. I don't need it for the process that I just walked you through but maybe you teach an ensemble or a group where you'd like to use the notation for it. We used to think, oh, to be authentic, you have to teach it the way it's taught in its culture of origin, right? When I first started teaching, that was a concern that we had. Well, this song would be taught orally, so I can only teach it orally. I think that we've come a long way where we now realize but our music class is a different context unto itself. It's a culture, our music ensemble, it's a culture unto itself where sometimes we work on notation reading skills. And so in that case, I think it's absolutely okay to at some point bring notation in. All right, here's the cuties. This little darling right here, don't feel bad for her. She's just five. She whacked somebody on the head with her stick right before we started. <laughs> so she's so cute and forlorn that sometimes when I show this video, people can't get past what happened to that adorable girl. Nothing. And when we performed this, we did put all of this together for an assembly. This darling came with a little tiara and a princess dress. <laughs> so, and she had her sticks and performed just beautifully. But again, this is just to show you, this was a first grade class that I was doing a residency with. I had spent maybe a total of 30 to 35 minutes on a oh, 10 minutes on a Monday, 10 minutes on a Tuesday, 10 minutes on a Wednesday. And this was on Thursday that we filmed this so that they could have it to practice back in their classroom. Right. Oh, adorable. Um, okay, so lots of materials from Ghana in the book, um, again, because it really came out of uh, my, my learning with Kwasi and our collaborations together over the years. And he used to come to, I, I taught in Connecticut from uh, the first 18 years of my career. And um, he would come, my last 10 years there, he came to my school every year. Um, and we just developed lots of materials. He would teach me things and then we would figure out how would this work? In, a, in the setting, right, with what we have and what they know and how much time I have and, and how much am I willing to flex my curriculum to allow us to focus deeply 
on, on these materials. Um, there are other materials. Um, one, there are a couple of selections from the country of Liberia, just, just west of Ghana, ever so slightly. And um, briefly, I'll show you why this one grabbed me. I came across it when I was listening to some really old field recordings. And um, children were singing this song. It sounds like this. I think it was catchy and it was fast. And in the recording, I could hear they were playing some kind of hand clapping game, but I couldn't see it and it didn't, you know, I couldn't find any notes or any information about what was the game, but I had a translation. And the translation, it's it's kind of silly. It's it seems like a bunch of lines that have been piggybacked from other songs stuck together and the people that were interviewed from Liberia in what I was reading said nobody really knows what that song is about anymore we all know it uh, it's from the VAI culture group in Liberia VAI we all know it but nobody knows why that line connected to that line and I thought that's interesting I like weird stories like that I like bringing stuff that you know sometimes I know a full deep history and sometimes I don't um, but I always know something something to say but what really caught my attention about this was 99% of this song is me, Ray, and Do. And at all levels, elementary, middle, beginning instruments, a sight reading and choir, we're always looking for simple things. This is not simple rhythmically. It's not rhythmically simple. Notation wise, I don't think I'd stick this up. But solfege wise, oh my goodness, completely. Oh, same, same sort of word process, but look, the solfege is just mi re, mi do, mi re, mi do, do, mi, mi re, mi, mi re, do, do, re. Talk about a recorder song that isn't hot crust buns or something to go along with your instrumental methods books, which by the way, please check your method books for con uh, controversial material. And let's not have our kids buy books that have controversial material. Let's not make them pay money, okay, for that. That's my big my big push. Um, but imagine being able to add something this unique, challenging, and yet with only three pitches, except for that re, la, do, re, do, down at the bottom. That really caught my attention as being a fun song, word challenging for sure. I go through the same sort of process after they've heard the song many, many times. Then I just bring them in on that last little syllable. So I would do go, 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 lo, so, le, they come in. And this might take many classes. Maybe I'm doing a few minutes on this, three minutes, four minutes, each rehearsal, each class over multiple meetings until eventually they've heard it so many times, it just starts to come out. Uh, and then I bring them in. Now, as an example in the book of a way to extend this out, while I was researching about Liberian music culture and traditions, and the Vi culture in particular, where this game comes from, this song, I learned that I've, somebody in the Vi community created what's called a syllabary, and it's these beautiful symbols. These are just some of them. And each of these symbols represents, I thought I wrote a couple of down, but maybe there was just in my mind <laughs> that I don't know them by heart. But for example, the first one in the upper left could be mm -hmm. the second one could be kra. the third one could be tsh. so they're, they're cluster sounds. And then when you put these beautiful images together, it creates words. And so the game that I came up with, and I keep the students well informed of that this is my hybrid. We learn about Liberia, we're looking at photos, we're looking at videos, we're listening to recordings, we're playing this game. And then I tell them about this syllabary and that I don't know how to use it in words, but that I love the images so much that I painted them on rocks, right? Which I did, I, I have about 10 rocks that I grabbed some of these and we play a rock passing game. Oh, boy. And whatever rock lands in front of you, you look at the image and with the person next to you, the two of you figure out how to make that shape. And I give them very little time to do so, you know. Go, make your shape. It's wild, it's fast paced. And it's allowing me to say, there's this fascinating thing that I don't know all the way about yet, 
but isn't it interesting to know and let's add it to our song it's not appropriating because I've researched, researched it as far as I can, and I'm being fully transparent about my depth of knowledge with this while going much further with other things, right? So I'm not keeping things at a surface. Well, this is a place from Liberia, and I don't know what it is, trying to have different levels of understanding of things. Just watching the time. Okay. Um, another example, there are arrangements in here that could be used um, for uh, older level ensembles, and I'm, I'd like to play this arrangement for you. Um, this is an arrangement that I put together a while back. Um, I asked Kwasi what he thought about me making it more choralized, and he said absolutely, and I talked to Kwasi about the two tunes that I wanted to use. One is this very first song that you see here. It goes like this. Now in the book, I, we, we crafted lessons that just introduced the song by itself, just like we did with Kafo, just like we did with Gongo, and give you all kinds of ideas of what if you just want to teach that song or play that song on an instrument. Then we introduce a second song in English. So we have one that's in Ewe, and it's a, it's a proverb, which is about somebody who's passed on and they're kind of in between places. They want to go back, they want to go forward. They're sort of stuck in an in-between land. Um, and we paired it with one in English, a joy like a river, joy like a river. You might know a version of that one, depending on what your background is here in the US. I teach it with Ghanaian English pronunciation, which would be riva, riva, right? Um, and pair these two together. And I added a harmony part and a descant. And my dear friend, and he's an amazing composer and arranger himself, Rob Hugh, we taught together for many years in West Hartford, Connecticut. Um, we co-conducted a festival choir together and we put this one on the program and he had some really great additions about an ending and um, just some thoughts about the harmony on the Joy Like Arriba as well. So I'd love to play this one for you. And this score comes as part of the book with permission to copy and a recording of a children's choir singing it. And this has been performed at national choirs at this point. Um, I had the joy of drumming on it when Nissa Brown conducted it for the Oak uh, National Children's Choir in 2019. That was, that was lots of fun. So I've got the recording queued up. And again, you get this recording as one of the downloadable files. That's a traditional Ghanaian drum, starting us off, playing a proverb. All that's in the book. just wrote a lower harmony. We know those. Right? Then we brought in a clapping ostinato. Looks like this. Will it call, respond? Death 
I wanted to include this in the book rather than to continue selling it as an octavo is I wanted people to see how simple this really can be and to allow you to see I don't consider myself to be a talented arranger but I forgot that I actually know quite a bit about music and so by taking these rich things that, that we're learning and talking to my teacher about well, how do you feel? And does this feel right to put these? He said, absolutely, it fits your setting. And it, uh, he said, it honors my culture and fits your setting, right? And this hybridity, this permission to celebrate these hybrid performances can be really special. Um, briefly, uh, so th that's, a, that's a quick and dirty run through um, Dance Like a Butterfly. But what I'm very, very excited about are upcoming projects that are also coming out through World Music Initiative. So as Brian mentioned, I am the editor of the series and I'm a sometimes author in the series as on Dance Like a Butterfly. The next project that will be coming out, it is so beautiful. Honestly, I'm so excited just so I can have a copy in my hands to look through. It's by Dr. Le Zhang, who is now in Shanghai and Dr. Sarah Watts, who's at Penn State University. And this beautiful art that you see on the cover is one of something like 35 custom paintings that they commissioned from uh, illustrator Shi Chi Liu to uh, pair with all of the songs and recordings that are in the book. Um, every song or recording has somebody that is an expert of that region. They're all from different regions throughout China. There are recordings of how to speak everything, including the names of the people that were interviewed there are recordings, it includes pinyin, which is the transliteration of the Chinese characters, and it also includes the Chinese characters. I even asked them to include a recipe because one of the songs was about moon cakes. And they said, well, now I wanna make moon cakes. So we put a recipe in there and all of those materials are also available for download. That, that's coming out probably early fall, we think. Does that sound? Reasonable, Brian. Early fall. It does. We are, we have a we we're in layout right now, and we'll be we'll be editing the final proof of the book here in the next month or so. So I think yeah, fall sounds like a, a very feasible deadline for this one. We're excited about it. I am super excited, as are Le and Sarah. Um, another book that is well underway here is by Korsha Hassan on the left, Minnesota Teacher of the Year last year. She's a Somali-American elementary teacher, and Becca Buck, uh, a local. Um, uh, Minnesotan, uh, white Minnesotan teacher, uh, music teacher. They've been collaborating on a book that hopefully, I hope they may finish it by the end of this school year. When Korsha became teacher of the year, she became very busy. <laughs> so we sort of put the book on hold a little bit while she met all of her obligations. And she's also become very active in uh, racial justice initiatives here during this last year. But they collected these songs from the children they teach here in Minnesota. And then they actually went to the family. So if a child contributed a song, then they went to the family's home and they had dinner together and saw the game or song played or sung at home. Um, and Korsha gathered all the information, interviewed the families, et cetera. So that one's coming. Um, I am finishing up a book with my dear friend, another dear mentor friend, Dr. Kedman Mopana, who is at the University of Dar es Salaam. He is very busy right now running a, a festival of traditional Wagogo music in the center of Tanzania, which is where these women in this beautiful picture, this will be on the cover, I believe. Um, so this, this one, we're, we're finishing it up and, and maybe in 2022, this one will be coming out. 
Um, and then I know I saw Joni on this call earlier. I hope Joni, this is okay that I mentioned it, but Joni's been working on a project that um, a life, a lifelong project, really. Um, she's a Northeast educator who has been for decades working throughout the Levant, which is uh, Jordan, uh, Israel, Syria, et cetera, uh, some other areas as well. And she's collaborating with a longtime teacher and friend, Wasim Ibrahim. Um, so that one will be forthcoming. We're, we're already working on the manuscript on this side of things um, to come to you soon. Whew, so that th those Thank are all of the things we're working on. Thank you so much, Karen. That was that was fantastic, wonderful uh, to watch all that. I, we don't have any questions, so I'm going to let uh, all the attendees know that you can go ahead and start putting some questions in the the Q and A area at the bottom, and I'll I'll feed those to Karen. But I I just have um, I guess a couple questions or maybe just a comment. I know that in the book there is some instrumental applications for some of these songs, which I don't think we got we just didn't have time to really get into. But do you want to just kind of briefly speak to some of the instrumental applications that are in the yes. book? Uh, absolutely. Let me just have it out in front of me. That's an a easier reference point. Sure. Uh, for example, one of the traditions that we included from Liberia is a xylophone tradition um, that's definitely transferable either to at the elementary or middle school level if they have xylophones or to recorders or to other melody playing instruments. So for typically in this um, xylophone tradition, one of the xylophones will set up um, a repeating ostinato. Da, 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 and then the response will be an improvisation from another part. So we kind of broke down how might that happen. We have a beautiful song from Senegal, a tio, yo, mama, tio, yo, that we uh, walked through how that might transfer over to wind instruments and an accompaniment on either ukuleles or guitars or barred instruments. We do talk a little bit about how any of these songs could easily be arranged for uh, band students um, or string students. It's just a matter of taking the tunes and, and putting it into the right keys, right? But at the same time, we hope that you would include the cultural information. So we don't want you to just bring the song over, but bring the song and the cultural information as well. Uh, in order to do so. Um, as far as I think those are the both of the ones from Senegal work that way. Oh, we brought in a piece. There's lots of uh, layered percussion in here. So there's a piece from Nigeria, Aki Wowo, Olokole, that has a five or six part percussion ensemble that you can pick one part or you can do all six, depending on the skill of who you have. Same for the um, choral arrangement that you just heard that can be done with no percussion or it can be done with up to five or six parts plus a clapping ostinato. So, um, and there's also choreography for a couple of the things. If it's simple enough to show in pictures, that's in the book or we did videos. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much, Karen. We have a question that came in from Linda, so I'm going to read that here to you. Okay. Um, do you have a recommendation for quick instruction, possibly on YouTube or elsewhere, to hear the rhythm patterns and learn to play the types of drum accompaniment you use? Um, it Well, <laughs> with the book, um, I can't remember if we did a video or just pictures. I know we have uh, pictures and the rhythm written out for everything. And I think I show, I think there are- You pictures. talked about where to place your hands on the yes. drums. I think there are pictures for the different hand positions. I kept it pretty simple with just two or three um, hand positions. Uh, there are absolutely other tutorials out there. Um, I would just search, um, that particular piece is called uh, Bobobo, B-O-B-O-B-O, -B -O -B -O, or B-O-R-B-O-R-B-O-R. -B -O -R -B -O -R. The O is actually a different character, um, but you can find it that way. I would I would do a search and, and see if you can find a tutorial for that, Linda. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't make one, but uh, somebody might. Perfect. All right, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, here's a question. Well, can you see the Q&A, Karen? I can, I, I can now. Should I just... Yeah, you can go ahead and respond to any of those that you want. I'm gonna say yeah. we, we responded to Linda's live, but Jeff has a question and I don't know how to uh, how to pronounce the, uh, I think it's an instrument. Yes, a gil. 
-hmm. Jeff is wondering if it's appropriate to use a gil with these songs. And a gil is a, a, a beautiful xylophone type instrument, a balafon that has uh, gourd resonators and it's pretty large. It's used in Ghana. Um, and the one from Liberia looks very similar. Um, so absolutely, I would say this is a gil from here. And then maybe I would do something from Ghana as well as the home place of the instrument. Uh, but some people have, for example, one drum. I had one drum at one time. I mean, now I'm obsessed and I have too many, but I used that one drum for every culture. And I would say, here's what it would be. Here's what we have. <laughs> so I always say, make do, but tell them about. So yes to the gil for sure. Perfect. Let's see. We got to I see. see another question from Helen. Do I have time to answer Helen? Yeah, please, please go for it. So Helen is asking, and don't be sorry for a long question. That's what that's what we're here for, really, to talk about and, and see what you're wondering. And um, can we please recommend some percussion instruments that would be smart purchases to outfit a high school choral classroom? Yes, just a few essentials not to break the bank. And um, Helen is not a percussionist, so wondering if there's just a few drums, if it would encourage folks to pick one up and give it a shot. I also feel funny using a drum to accompany a song if it's not from the same country. Yeah, I I, I give myself permission to to do so. Um, and I like I said, I just always explain. Um, the only time I probably wouldn't do that, I don't do very much sacred music anyway. I probably wouldn't use something that is part of a sacred ritual. You know, if that maybe that I wouldn't do that. But otherwise, I use what I've got and I, I try to find a recording of to play. Yes, but as far as what's a great instrument to have, okay, for choirs and for um, instrumental ensembles, we love the djembe, the djembe, D-G-E-M-B-E. The djembe is really from Guinea, which is a country in West Africa, Guinea, Mali, Burkina Faso. They're just north of Ghana. Right, the djembe isn't from Ghana, but of course, you know you'll you'll see it played there. But now you'll even see choral songs from South Africa with people playing djembe. And how did that happen? Well, because we kept doing that here in the U.S. and YouTube videos went around, and choirs in other countries were like, "Hey!" And right, so so it's this whether it's a great thing or not, I don't know, but uh, that started becoming standard. So I would say a couple of djembes or for about $100 a drum, you can get something like a tubano, which are sturdy and they're very forgiving. If you don't have technique, you can pretty much just touch it and something will come out. Uh, and they're a lot sturdier and less climate sensitive than a djembe, but djembes are mm, just very beautiful. That's great. I was I, I went on tour with um, with my college choir and we went to South Africa and we actually performed with a number of South African choirs. Oh, and lucky we got you. to perform uh, with uh, a few people that were performing on Jumbe down there. So that was really that was really fun. Yeah, and I think you know there are places in the world where choral traditions aren't paired with percussion. There are places in the world where it's not paired with dance, right? That's that's just kind of how it is. Um, but we're in a different time. We're in a different time now where you can see something and be inspired by it. And mashups are sort of the standard now. Um, so, so times, I, I'm always fascinated by how, how I'm, a, I'm a folklore junkie at heart, and yet I love the hybrid nature of things. Oh, right, Marilyn makes a great point. Thank you, Marilyn. There are, there are fiberglass and plastic headed djembes. So you can get one of those as well, yes. Um, they're loud as heck. So, you know, just come, come at those gently. Thank you for that very good point. I will ask a question that maybe maybe is on some people's minds and I, I know the answer to it, but I want you to, um, to have a chance to speak on this. What if, what if I'm um, worried about approaching the language for some of these songs or uh, not knowing what the songs are about, the translation, for instance, how does this, how can this book help me in that area? Yes. Well, we have absolutely tried to pick songs that are approachable by not having extensive numbers of verses. Um, and by the approach that I decided to use after we talked at length about what's, what are we going to do here was to create a phonetic 
spelling, not IPA, which is the International Phonetic Alphabet. Usually the people that use it are choral directors and not all choral directors use it. And of those who do, they often just use the one for vowel color and shape, and right? Um, so I thought rather than IPA, which won't necessarily be helpful for everybody, I did a phonetic pronunciation based on kind of a generic US English, um, which if you're coming from a different first language, you may have to flip to American English first and then use the phonetics. There are also recordings of the song spoken slowly and mm -hmm. then at speed and then sung as well. So you can hear them in context and practice. The practice tracks are meant for you. Um, you know, not necessarily, they weren't made to be used in class, but you know, they're made to help you feel more confident. And then the slides as well for each song, mm -hmm. kind of suggesting a method for presenting it. And I wanted to quickly mention if, if attendees are curious on the on our website, and I put a link to the book uh, in the chat, but on our website, we do have a preview of the table of contents. So you can see exactly how many songs are presented uh, to represent each country, each West African country that's mentioned in the book. Um, as, and it's basically just the titles of the songs there um, in the table of contents. So I thought that might be of interest to some people to see how many and what the titles of the songs are. Um, well, we don't have any more questions coming in, and I think we've really covered quite a lot in this last hour. Thank you so much, Karen, for your passion, your very clear passion, your energy, your insight. Um, I think this was wonderful. I personally love seeing how you're able to take this, um, this traditional repertoire from West African countries and apply you know, your creativity to, to this material. And I hope that's very inspirational to a lot of the, the teachers who are here with us today. And so, and thank you to everyone who was able to uh, attend tonight. Like I mentioned, it's, it's been recorded. We'll get this up uh, on, our, on our YouTube and Facebook pages shortly. And, uh, and the promo code once again is butterfly15. So I think that is everything. Thank you so much, Karen, and uh, have a good evening, everybody. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. You can find me at St. Thomas. I'm happy to help.